<laughs> All right, welcome back to Portland. Good to see you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. How you doing? I'm great. Cold. Hey. It's not like this in Georgia, but I'm loving the snow, surprisingly. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I was talking to Sarah. Do you guys like being up here, getting away from... Uh, I mean, it's not 90 down in Atlanta, is it right now? Or? No, definitely not. I mean, no. it's, it's cold enough to be annoying, and you don't get the pleasure of the snow, so it's kind of just pointless cold. Yeah. <laughs> so, How's your off-season going? It's been very good. This off-season has been a little bit different. Um, previous off-seasons, um, the approach is kind of unsure, just because um, you're going through the minor leagues, and everything is based towards progression and development. So now that I've had a little bit of a taste of the big leagues, I've kind of been able to change my direction within the off season where I'm working more so with a purpose, where I'm not just out there saying I'm going to try and get strong and fast. Um, this past season, I played second, I played first, I played third, and they even talked about me playing outfield. So after uh, analyzing myself, my performance, and where I may be needed, I've acknowledged um, whether it's a utility spot or anything else, I just want to be available. So as long as I'm in the lineup, I'll be happy. So this off season, I really focused on not so much as getting strong and fast, everything like that, but I've worked on my mobility. I've worked on being able to better my footwork around the base at second base. I've, been work I've just tried to uh, put myself in best of a position to help the team however I can, honestly. Yeah, and is that you go to a special performance center? I, I saw Marcus Wilson out in Arizona doing just different agility drills. So what are some of the things that you're doing to get quicker? Um, I've worked at the same um, off-season training facilities since I've been in pro ball. It's called Rapid Performance. They do a really good job. And um, a lot of the stuff is more so instead of I'm just, instead of going out there and seeing how hard, how heavy I can bench and make sure everybody's watching me in a tank top, I, um, <laughs> I'll wear a long sleeve. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Spandex, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, everything, there's just a whole lot more work on not so much heavy weight, but like a lighter weight and working on a range of motion, whether it's within my shoulders, my hips, or everything like that. So we've also incorporated some um, running technique work, some uh, ladder drills, which sounds simple. I mean, we've all done ladder drills before. But I'm working with a purpose to orient that work and progress towards baseball. So it's actually just working with more of a focus and more of a purpose. All healthy, I know, a couple of injuries last year. You, you still had a great year, but I, but I know that getting hurt's never fun, but it's, it's out of your system now. Yeah, no problems at all. Everything feels good. So um, beginning of the off-season, I was actually feeling pretty good, so I started working out earlier this off-season as well. And uh, I'm just really excited to get to spring training. This year, it's a little bit different. I kind of have an idea of what to expect. Last year was my first uh, big league camp in playing, so it's kind of that whole, like, don't get in the way of the older guys I'm scared of. Don't say anything dumb, which happened every day. And um, this year, it's like, um, obviously, I'm still battling for and fighting for a position. But I have a little bit, well, obviously, I have a better chance. But also, I have a better idea of what it's like in the clubhouse. And I'm not sure if you all can see it, but like the atmosphere in our clubhouse is pretty special. You can tell, uh, like Alex was talking about, about how it's a homegrown team and we have so many homegrown players so within our clubhouse you can really see how people are close and how I mean we spend so much time together every single year we spend more time with this team than we do with our family that's just how it is because of the schedule so last spring training I went in there trying to just get a, a taste and try and see what that was like and now having been part of that family um, growing on that and then just becoming a bigger part of it is something I'm looking forward to and it's unique in the fact that some of the guys who are so-called veterans are not that old yeah. So they went through what you went through not long ago. And they, I know that Mookie means a lot to you, too. I mean, I, I know. And, but there's a lot of those guys in similar age that are, are very inviting when you walk in there. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that really helped make me comfortable. When I first made my debut, um, I, was, I almost missed my first flight. Like, it was a mess the first day. But then going into the clubhouse and having familiar faces and then just having them be so welcoming. I mean, you hear so many stories about guys getting called up and then them being, making them dress up as princesses and thrown in trash cans and stuff. And I was ready for it, but I didn't have that. I'm sure Joe has some stories about that kind of stuff. Back in the day, it was wild. Princess no Joe, no? no. <laughs> but um, I was welcomed as soon as I came. And just, I think a lot of that has to do with the family atmosphere and approach that they have within the team where they acknowledged I'm here to help. I'm here to just do my job and do what I can to help the team. And that's, uh, I think that that has a lot to do with our team and how close we are. Yeah, It's really, uh, we're always excited to see a former C-Dog go up. You weren't here that long ago, but 
your path. You, you were talking about how you played second in a spring training game with the Red Sox. Mm -hmm. I saw you playing second base in the backfields, and that's when the – okay, why is he playing second? Well, we figured it out. Yeah, it was yeah. a little bit of a, a curveball to me, too. I believe it was probably – Four weeks before I went to spring training, I got a call, and they were like, hey, uh, it's not anything definite yet, but just so you're aware, we might have you start working at second base. And I was like, okay, cool. And then I got to spring training, and obviously we started taking some ground balls and stuff like that. But my first time playing second base in my entire life was against the Nationals, like the Major League Nationals. And I was at second base, and I was like, I have no idea what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> just, um, just how it is. So... Um, but having the opportunity to learn from Alex and Fabulous and uh, P Dustin Pedroia, how about that? <laughs> um, I mean, I grew up being a huge fan of Dustin Pedroia, so when he texted me and texted me, <laughs> I, I took a screenshot of the text, cause I was, and I sent it to my mom, and I was like, Mom, I just got a text from Dustin Pedroia. <laughs> like, I, I, I've had a lot of, uh, yeah. I guess, fangirl moments, I guess you could call it, but um, the second base thing, it's, it's been a lot of fun. I really enjoy playing it. Yeah, and... It, it's amazing in baseball. So you, you play third, you play first, but being in that up the middle, completely different view, right? Vision-wise, it's, it's just crazy how just A lot of that, the angles you know, are different, you're right. So one of the things, so I was drafted as a shortstop and transitioned over to third base. So um, when I started playing second base, at first the angles and everything were a little bit weird, but the biggest difference is just how you have to change the direction for a double play. Yeah. Um, so having played shortstop and then third base as well, everything that I did, I feel did working towards my left, whether it be second base or first base, I was still working through the ball towards the left. So learning how to just change that direction to work towards second base from the second base position was just a little bit different. But um, then having played shortstop, the angles were a little bit similar. And it, I think it honestly helped me understand what I needed to do to be a good well, I'm not saying I'm a good second baseman yet. It's just something I'm working at. But understand what it takes to be a good second baseman. So um, I know how tough it is to get a bad feed or a feed up far on your glove side from second baseman towards shortstop. So it was something that I made conscious of to be aware of giving a good feed because if I give a trash feed, there's no shot we can get him on the other end. So just being aware of those things that I learned and experienced from playing shortstop, I think it benefited me on the other side as well. And it seems like it helps the pe people around you have made you feel comfortable. And I... I can imagine that Xander Bogarts is very inviting and is easy oh, to yeah. work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, I didn't really know Bogey too well before this season, um, but I had heard about his character and how he was just a good person. And I, I can confirm he is as genuine and as kind as they come. So I was very thankful for that. So take us through the whole getting called up. And I mean, obviously, your mind's going, what, zero to 1,000 that day? Yeah, I made a lot of phone calls, and I can't tell you what was said on them. But I woke up, we were in um, Binghamton maybe? No, that's double A. I don't even remember where we were. And I woke up to three missed calls, and I was like, wow, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so I took a second to gather my thoughts, look through texts or anything to figure out what I did wrong, just so I'd be aware of what I was walking into. And uh, the manager in AAA is Billy Mack, and he told me I was going to the big leagues. And I literally replied, I was like, that's not funny, dude. Don't don't mess with me. Like, what's, yeah. what did I do? He was like, no, you're really going to the big leagues. And I probably said some bad words, but, like, it was unbelievable. And I actually told him, I was like, I wanted to know who we're playing, where am I going, and stuff like that. And he said, oh, you're playing Tampa Bay. I'm like, okay, cool. Um, just being me, I'm pretty open about everything. I was like, I just don't want my first at-bat to be against Alvarado. I faced him throughout the GCL. I was 0 for a million against him. I just, for the first one, let's not do that. So I get to Tampa. It's like the fourth inning, and they're like, yeah, you're about to pinch hit. And I'm like, where? <laughs> I'm in jeans. I, my stuff is still in my bag. Like, I don't even, do I have a number? Um, all these questions and things are going through my head. Luckily, I didn't pinch hit that day. I think Vasquez hit a home run or something, so thank God for Vasquez. Um, so the next day we're going in, and I end up do pinch hitting. And, of course, it's against Alvarado. <laughs> and... Just another cool moment for me, just walking through, looking back at this life-changing moment of me making my debut. Um, everybody knows JD is an incredible hitter. Like, he's next level in regards to his work ethic, his focus to what he's doing, and how he just continually wants to learn about hitting. So going into this at bat, I was like, honestly, guys, I'm, it's not looking good for me, just given my track record with this guy. I don't, I don't see him well. And JD told me this, 
approach and swing thought that was the complete opposite of anything that I'd ever thought or would consider against a lefty, especially Alvarado with his power sinkers. And I've never been big leagues before, and I'm never going to tell JD, like, no. <laughs> so um, uh, he tells me his actual game plan against him, and being young, uh, one of the big things that I learned this year was how important game planning for your at-bats was and everything like that. And a lot of that knowledge has come from JD. So the whole reason I got my first hit is because of JD. Like, that's kind of a joke, but it's not, because I'm, I honestly don't think I ever got a hit against Alvarado before that, but it just has to show how important just having the right approach or game plan is to every single pitch and every at-bat. It's really remarkable what he does with the iPad, recording all his, and I saw in spring training, he came into the backfields and played in the minor league games, and he wanted all those at-bats uh, shot on his iPad, iPhone, and wanted to, I mean, that's the work ethic. He's religious set. about it, and it's yeah. something I've paid a whole lot of attention to. I mean, he has, a, we call it JD's bag of tricks. He has this big uh, duffel bag, like a full-size duffel bag, and it's full with just a bunch of tools and things that he's developed. And if you look at it from, like, an outside person, you'd be like, why do you have a bunch of Frisbees and toys in your bag? Yeah. Like, you're kind of a weird child. Yeah. But <laughs> then you see, like, how he uses them and how they have a purpose. And, I mean, he has a whole hoop and stuff, but he makes them all work, and he actually has a purpose for all of it. So just seeing how he works and just the amount of focus. Like, he doesn't do anything baseball-oriented without a plan and being aware of what he's doing, and I think that's very impressive. Like, every single at-bat, every swing and BP in the cage, every single thing that he does, he knows exactly what he's doing, and he's working with a purpose. And that's not easy to do for 162 games in a year. And he really worked to get where he was. He was, I believe, the sixth outfield in, outfielder in A-ball at one point in the Astros system. Yeah, I mean, he, he'll even tell you. He, yeah. uh, he told me multiple times. He was like, I was horrible. He, he, he'll say he was a horrible hitter. He was a bad ball player. And talk about how just being focused on hitting and trying to be aware of what he was doing just changed his career. Talk about the, the first home run that had to be special, of course. Um, I was actually talking about that earlier. And um, I've seen the video, thankfully, because I could not tell you what was happening. <laughs> um, I, with the swing, I knew I swung and I knew I was on time and I hit it. But, like, rounding the bases... Um, any noise I heard, I have no idea. Like, I was floating. You I think my trot looked kind of smooth. Enough? But, um, yeah, it's a righty Dominguez or something. Alcantara, I believe Alcantara. his name. Alcan yeah. yeah. So, um, honestly, for me, my favorite part, I mean, obviously, you dream of your first home run and everything like that. So, that's why I was walking on air. But um, afterwards, I got to see my mom and everything like that. But I got to see the video of her reaction and with my girlfriend. By the way, that needs to be acknowledged. It's my girlfriend, not my sister. Everybody thought... It was my sister, and then there's a picture of me kissing her after the game, and it got real weird. So, so I just want to get that out there. <laughs> yeah, everybody was like, Chavis has a family issue. And I'm like... <laughs> Sounds like a reality show. Huh? Yeah, not quite. <laughs> so um, just uh, having seen their reaction and um, knowing everything that my mom sacrificed for me to get to this point. I mean, we had a tough childhood, and she took on extra jobs and everything in order literally just to pay for me to play baseball. So just having seen that, and um, I'm very thankful for it. Yeah. We're proud of you, too. Thank you. And, and Mike is terrific follow on Twitter, by the way. Yeah. So we, you follow him, yeah? Thank you. Everyone counts. <laughs> so I, I know you're, you're really pumped up about Mookie. You, you put that out there on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, I am. Mookie, technically Mookie was assigned to me from what I learned later on. But Mookie, as soon as I got to the big leagues, he kind of took me under his wing. Um, being young and dumb, um, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, the Red Sox and MLB as a whole do a really good job of preparing you for the um, – big league lifestyle and what to expect but there's just so much that you that goes into every single day and like JD hits at this time and you sure don't want to be in the cage because you're going to get kicked out like that kind of little stuff so Mookie really took me under his wing and taught me just beyond baseball he taught me a lot about just like life and how to be professional which means a lot to me so um everybody was aware of what was going on. So just um, knowing that Mookie's going to come back and not only I get to play with him, but I get to learn and be around him and interact with him a little bit longer every single day is something I'm really looking forward to. Yeah, I mean, he's really emerged as, as the leader. I mean... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, everybody sees his performance and sees um, 
everything he does on the field. Yeah. But I think, like I said, all the behind the scenes stuff just doesn't really get as much attention for obvious reasons because nobody's there. And he really does do a lot for not just me, but the whole team, which I know many people are thankful for. So I'm, it's not a joke. It's not any eyewash. Yeah. It's just I'm truly thankful that he's back. What are some of the best pitchers you faced? And I know you get called up the Tampa Bay, and they have glass now. It's pretty good. Mm-hmm. But were there just a couple guys besides Alvarado that gave you fits? Um, one, the one thing I learned is everybody in the big leagues is good. Yeah. I mean, obviously, it's the big leagues. But you, you kind of get, like in AAA, you'll, you, pretty much everybody's good, but it's just different. When you get to the big leagues, everybody's there for a reason. Everybody is aware of what they're doing, and it's, it's a whole different level of professionalism. Um, there were many days or pitchers that I would struggle with. I mean, it's baseball. You're going to fail a lot. But um, I, I got to face Verlander, and I remember being on deck, and I'm like, wow, I had him on my fantasy team. <laughs> <laughs> like, he, he was my ace on PlayStation for a while. And, I mean, I know what pitch I would call the square, but yeah. that's not the one that I got. So, <laughs> so was it similar when you were in the box? You were like, oh, this is like PlayStation now. No, I was like, damn, he's tall. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry for cussing. But um, <laughs> there were a lot of moments like that where just going through the season, it's just, and it's something I talked about earlier as well, where it's just you have to find that borderline area where it's like I want to appreciate and be aware of everything that I'm accompl- I've accomplished and that I'm in this moment. I mean, yeah. I worked my entire life, and I dreamed about this since I was a child. But then you also have to be able to turn it off and be like, I don't care that Mike Trout's hitting. <laughs> I have to perform. So it's just kind of finding that area of, like, I have to focus and take care of my business and know that I belong. But I also want to appreciate and be aware of everything going on. And the game is also younger. So you've probably seen a lot of guys that you played against at all levels. And then oh, you go yeah. up there and you say, yeah, I know that guy. I know that guy. And it's pretty cool. Like, that's one of the things that um, the Fall League really helps with yeah. is you get to play with, uh, it's the Arizona Fall League, in case anyone wasn't aware. And what they do is they take, I believe it's eight teams, and they take four teams, and they combine it to make one of the teams. So you, uh, my team was the Braves, the Mariners, the Blue Jays, the Padres, and a bunch of other teams. So in the upcoming years after playing that, like, I got to see a Cunha debut. And I was like, oh, I played with and against him. And then when I got to the big leagues, there were people I played with and against who just became a familiar face. And instead of just being wow, I can't believe I'm here, I don't really have anybody. You just find a couple familiar faces and people to kind of stick to, and it just kind of makes you feel more comfortable. Yeah, th- those rosters are, are unreal. The Trout and Harper played together in the fall league. Yeah, I mean, it's a that good was, time. Yeah. There's nobody in the stands, but it's, it's, just, it's, it's really different. It's not a joke. There's nobody in the stands, but <laughs> it's, it, it truly is some of the best competition in baseball. It, it's, uh, it's like a top prospect type thing, so it's really cool getting to see and play against all these players, and I remember – when I was in the Fall League, it was kind of interesting just to see, you hear all the names, and this is obviously at a little bit of a lower level because at the time everybody's prospects. But just getting to see all the names and stuff that you hear about, and it just kind of, you realize that everybody's human. Like, I saw Mookie yeah. Betts strike out this year. That was wild. Yeah. Didn't know that happened. <laughs> so it's just, it's a joke, but it's also real. Like, you, you don't realize that people go through struggles. Everybody goes through rough patches and that everybody is human. But you also get to learn from seeing those kind kind of things to see how they get out of that patch. Like when Mookie or JD or anybody else is going through something, they don't just say, oh, it'll figure itself out. They go and put in the work, and they work with a purpose like I talked about earlier. So it's just – it's really interesting to be able to see both sides. Yeah, because we, we hear like with the great ones, well, they just have natural ability, which yes, but we don't realize how much a Michael Jordan worked to get to where he was or J.D. Martinez. Right. There's a lot of extra hitting. Manny – Back in the day, mm-hmm. put in a lot of extra hitting. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's get back. I got some a cool thing we found that Jalen, you talked about Jalen Brown. Oh. Dunked on you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you tweeted it, so I mean. I know, I, had, I talked yeah, about it a lot. Yeah. I did like a thread about it when I was in the minor leagues, but nobody cared then. <laughs> um, yeah, so you can all look at me and know I'm not good at basketball. <laughs> so I was like, a glorified six man. That's what I called myself because when Armel, our point guard, got tired, my time to shine. <laughs> so we're playing Wheeler. It's where Jalen Brown went to high school. And we, per- we were preparing for this game for probably about two weeks. Like it was a really big game. We had a pretty good team. So we were all looking forward to this. And we were preparing for this game 
while playing other teams. That's how important this game was. It's at our own, our own court and all that. And they warned me so many times that they ran this, not only their entire offense, but they ran this specific play around Jalen where their point guard, who's a pretty good shooter, is going to throw the ball and act like he's shooting. And no doubt, and obviously, it's an alley-oop. I'm 5'11". <laughs> I see this dude toss up what I thought was a shot. And for some reason, I'm like, I got that. <laughs> so just in the heat of the moment, I'm like, you know, we're at home. Ashley's looking. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, and I, I, for some reason, I go up to try and catch this air ball that I see happening. And I'm not going to say what, but something hit me. <laughs> behind my head and I turned on the ground and looked up and he was still hanging by the rim and I remember thinking that's a large man and he fell down and he looked at me and I was embarrassed and I got booed by my home team and that was the last time I played that season I lost my six man spot because Jalen Brown dunked on me at my home team home stadium Basketball sucks. <laughs> so, have you been to a Celtics game? And yeah, and I'm not talking to him. No, I'm not talking no. about it. Like, <laughs> I saw a video of it. I've, I've, tried, I've tried to find the video. I have no idea where it is. But I saw the video after, and I was like, "Damn." Yeah. <laughs> but like, he was the same size in high school. Like, I was the same size, but I'm not impressive physically. Yeah. He could dribble and dunk and shoot, and he was huge. And everything, like the player that he is now is the same player that he was in high school, and it was just, I had no chance. I had no chance. So it was, it was no doubt. No, I wasn't yeah. competing yeah. at all. Yeah. Like, what am I going to say? Do see me on the baseball field. No. <laughs> Do you pitch? Like, no. I, I had nothing to say. Co Coach Carver pulled me out, and he was mad at me like I did it on purpose. I think you guys should reunite it's, at some point at... at I'll play him in one horse. One. Yeah, horse, there you go. I did tweet, because he's a grade below me, so I did tweet him that next year, because I was in pro ball and I was feeling myself, and I was like, you know what? I'm verified on Twitter. I'm going to challenge him to one-on-one. -on -one. And he actually said he wanted to, and I didn't reply. <laughs> Joe, I didn't reply because I was scared. I'm not saying X scared. I was scared, though. You also did something really nice for some youngsters in Massachusetts this year. I know that they tweeted about that. Tell us that story. Um, yeah, it's something I kind of try to do periodically. Um, when people tweet me or anything like that, I, I try to pay attention to it, but obviously some things get lost. But I just got tweeted. Um, it was just a cool story about their kids and stuff like that and how they're huge fans of mine. So they wanted me just to tweet them, hey, and just literally just acknowledge them. So I just kind of got interested because they typed out a whole paragraph explaining the situation and how they were huge fans of mine. And I just, they're, they're little kids, obviously. And I just think it's so, it's obviously really cool, but it's just so weird that I have fans and little kids looking up to me just because I still act and consider myself a child. <laughs> um, so it's just something that I try to be very thankful and appreciative of. So whenever I get the opportunity, um, I try to take advantage of it. So these kids wanted their dad to tweet me um, just to say hey. So I decided that for Christmas, I would send them all a bunch of uh, batting gloves, cleats, uh, bat, bobbleheads, and a bunch of stuff that I had signed just as a surprise for Christmas. And 11-11. That's oh, it. Yeah. yeah. It's You've been a, doing that for how many years? I've been I, since I started Twitter, like in my sophomore year of high school, so like 2012, 11, something like that. And um, mark it on your calendars because it's going to be a holiday in a few years. It's something we're working towards. I'm working towards. <laughs> um, and so it started out just because everybody knows 11, 11, make a wish and stuff like that. So that's how I started doing it, just tweeting it because I was 14, 15 years old and I thought I was cool. Um, but now it's kind of progressed into, um, I'm a very religious person. It's not something I'm ashamed of. I don't hide it. I'm not trying to put it in everybody's face because I understand everybody has their own beliefs and everything like that. But for me, I just kind of altered instead of making 11-11 a wish, 
because wishes, I hate to say it, wishes don't come true. You have to work for stuff. Um, instead of just making a wish, it kind of just, I kind of just changed my perception where 11-11, instead of just making a wish, I decided to start praying. So every 11-11, whether I'm tweeting it or whether I just see it, it's just a reminder for me to say a quick prayer and just uh, say everything that I'm thankful for. So it's not a great story, but that's just how it is. It's a good story, yeah. Thanks. And you're, you're consistent with it. I mean, you're, it's every 11, yeah. I try to be, but I kind of got caught where there was like a time period where like I didn't tweet for a month. And if you scrolled through my timeline, it was just like 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11. I was like, I need to show that I'm like a human. <laughs> so I, I kind of like, if I miss it every now and then, it's, it, I feel like it's a little more acceptable. Yeah. So I, I was in Atlanta uh, this year, and I was there with uh, my mom's uh, cousin who was older, but he knew exactly who you were and said you were a legend at Sprayberry High School in Atlanta. <laughs> so, I, I mean, he's 60s and... and said, wow. oh, I know who Michael Chavis is, yeah. Yeah, I think that stuff is so wild. Like I was talking about earlier, I think it's just, um, I'm super thankful for it, that people know who I am, and if I go in public, somebody's like, are you Michael Chavis? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just think it's so wild that I get recognized or people care to take, that y'all are here and wanted to take pictures with me. Thank you for that. Like, I mean, it sounds lame, but I'm thankful that people care enough about me or that I'm relevant enough for you to want to take a picture or interact with me. So thank you all for that interest alone. But um, I honestly have to say that um, just for something personal for me, I'm pretty passionate about childhood cancer. Um, back home, um, I do a bunch of Brian McCann stuff. When I was growing up, I did this thing, and it was uh, called SMART, and it was socially mature athletes reaching um, thousands. And what we did was we went into children's hospitals and just interacted with kids and everything like that. So um, I think it's so wild that people look up to me and like I get called a role model and I'm people's favorite player. And like I'm on the cover of this pamphlet handed out, but while you were talking, Lauren, the whole time, all I was thinking was that you inspired me. And that's not a joke or anything sappy to say, but that's just the truth. What you've overcome and what you've achieved, I think is beyond impressive. So that's something for you. You're a good man. I try to be. Yeah, my mom would kick my ass if I wasn't. <laughs> this is my, my favorite story, though, about you is when you, I think you talked to Jen McCaffrey from WEI.com. You said you used to get worried about being traded mm -hmm. because there was, you were third and there were guys ahead of you. And mm -hmm. then you said, you know what? I'm done. Yeah. It worked out, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Um, when I first signed in the GCL and in Greenville, I uh, decided at 18 years old that I was smart enough to determine what I needed to do to get called up, what needed to happen with transactions, and when I was going to debut. In my opinion, I was ready at 18. <laughs> so I've learned, one, I was not ready at 18, but two, that um, this, you can't control things that are out of your control, obviously. It sounds dumb. But just call-ups, um, how somebody else is doing in front of you, um, Honestly, in just general performance, like if I go out there and I try to do a bunch of stuff and I try to chase numbers and I try to chase a call up or something like that, I just learned that it didn't work for me. And by chasing those numbers, I just got away from myself and I didn't enjoy the game. And it's kind of, it was kind of a tough thing to learn and comprehend. But when I focus on team oriented things and team oriented approaches while I'm hitting, playing defense and everything like that, it not only allows me to have more fun, but it makes me play better. Um, when I'm not having fun, I'm not a good baseball player. I don't play baseball for this. I play baseball because I love playing baseball. Yeah. There's a reason why I have to set a date for when I can start hitting in the offseason. It's because if I don't, I'll hit every single day. Yeah. It's just how I am. It's how I have been my entire life. So um, I, early on in my career, I just kind of lost that enjoyment and love for the game by trying to chase. I, I, I mean, it is a job. Playing baseball is my job. It's what I do. But... I learned that if I try and treat it like a job every single day, that it becomes a job, and I lose the enjoyment and the fact that it's a game and that people know me because I play a game and because I like to smile on TV and stuff like that. So by learning that and then putting it into my, not just my game and performance, but in my life, it's something that really did change my life and my perception of a lot of things. Well, I think since so many have mentored you, you have a chance now. If a Bobby Dahlbeck is up there, if who knows comes up there down the road, you're going to be now that guy. 
Absolutely. And yeah. there are things that I've learned and things that from my personal experience of when I first got called up that I'm going to relay to them and try and help them even more than not saying that I wasn't helped, but just things that maybe would have helped me or that I thought would have been more beneficial to be aware of. Just simple things like that. So that is something that I'm looking forward to. This was great. We really appreciate having you here. You're a good man. You've done a lot, but you're just scratching the surface. Absolutely. And, and we, uh, yeah. thank you again for having me. I really do appreciate it. Thank you.